if you start being out in nature and moving around, that can be pretty hard. To make it a little bit easier for you, I'll give you six tips today on how to improve your hiking skills. Hey guys, welcome to the high ground. My name is Fabio and today we're discussing six tips for hikers. Now a little bit of my background. I spend a lot of time in the mountains and outdoors. I am roughly in the mountains for 200 days per year. I was doing the Swiss mountain guide exam. Um, I got now sidelined due to an injury, but uh, soon I will be back on track. If you're interested in that journey and might even want to join training, so check out our Friday episodes. And yeah, today I want to give you just from my experience some tips for hiking, because hiking is the fundamental movement that we do in the mountains. Whatever you're doing, if you're climbing, if you're mountaineering, the basis will always, um, almost always be hiking either up to the hut or to the glacier or to the, the um, approach to the climbing route. Okay, so let's get started. The first thing that most people, especially beginners, totally forget, but also more experienced people, but for, because of different reasons, is planning and preparation. You should make sure that you research the trail, that you really have a good idea how the trail looks and where it actually goes through the landscape. So don't only read a description that you found somewhere, but really look at the map and say, hey, yeah, this is where the way should be going, the trail. And after two hours, I expect to see a lake. And after five hours, I expect to be on the summit. Um, so make sure that you really have a good preparation. That also entails that you should always be aware of the weather, not only the weather on this day, but how the weather was in the previous days or even weeks when it comes to snow and avalanche risk, but also what the development of the weather will be in the hours and maybe days after you uh, plan to end your hike. Because, I mean, how often did it happen that people took longer uh, for their hike than they expected and then they were um, surprised by bad weather and that's not a good surprise. And of course, only if you have proper knowledge of the route and where you will actually go and climb or hike, um, only then will you be able to bring the appropriate gear. If you know that there is a chance of high winds, well, you might bring a windproof jacket instead of just an ordinary insulation jacket, right? So those details matter as well. To connect this with a short story, um, I said also more experienced people make mistakes in that regard. And with my outdoor experience, I always thought, yeah, well, I might also be able to just go out there and hike. And there we were in the US, <laughs> in the uh, Cascades. And we planned to do a hike. And I looked at the, the title of the hike. Um, it was from via a trail that leads to one lake, but then should go off to another lake. And I looked at that and said, oh yeah, we're going from there to one lake to the other lake. And in my mind, it was like we're going from start to lake A to lake B. But the intention of the person who wrote the description was, yeah, you're going to the star, from the start to a crossroad, and there you go off to lake B. Um, that's not bad because, or it wasn't, too bad, but the hike was much longer than we expected. So because we, we um, calculated with 12 or 14 miles and then we were up to, I think, almost 20 miles. So that makes a difference, right? And it happened to me not because I don't know how to do proper planning, but because I was not humble and <laughs> maybe even a little bit arrogant and thought, yeah, well, it's somewhere out in the national parks and a lot of people hike it. I can do that. Come on, guys, we're, we're in the hills. We're not even properly in the mountains. At least that's what I thought from a Swiss perspective, right? So um, 
this is where the more experienced mountaineers or outdoor people fail. And yeah, so did I. Second tip, um, be aware of the important safety considerations for the area that you're in. This is about how trails are marked. For example, in Switzerland, you have a very um, intricate system of trail markings, which will tell you how hard the trail will become that you're actually walking on. So it's possible that um, at the highest uh, currently in Switzerland is if it is a blue, white, blue market and marking. And if you, th that, that trail might look fairly easy at the beginning, but it is well possible that there is a climbing passage, uh, maybe one mile down the trail, right? So be aware of this stuff. Be aware of any hazard from the environment. Um, that might be, of course, the weather, which we already discussed, but it also might be something like rockfall, uh, mud or snow avalanches. Um, there is nothing that kills more people in the mountains than avalanches. So this is a big thing, especially in winter, but not only in winter. And also make sure that you know how to um, get help when something should happen. It's possible that you're very remote and you need to use a Garmin inReach or something like that. It's also possible that you're in a place like Switzerland where you almost all everywhere have cell phone reception and then you can just call somebody, but you need to know the right number. The third tip is don't walk the trail down blindly, but actually navigate while you're walking. Take a map with you, take a compass with you, if necessary, take a protractor with you. If you don't know how to use that stuff, um, check out my LandNav series that I did on this channel. I will also link it down in the description below and somewhere up here in the video. The fourth tip is, and this is actually something that is then skill related, make sure that you have a proper height hiking technique. That begins with not starting too fast. Most people start with a way too fast pace when they start walking up the mountains. With the more experience that you get in the mountains, you will of course be fitter, but you will also get much more efficient in the way that you walk. And that will make a lot of the um, of the speed that you will actually then get over time in the mountains. So don't compare yourself with people who spend their life in the mountains, especially if those are, for example, older people. I mean, they can be super fast, right? That's just because they are so used to the movement, to moving through the mountains and that they are so efficient. And so don't start too fast. In this regard, figure out if you want to use tracking poles or not. There are three ways that you can, how you can do it. You can go with two tracking poles, you can go with one tracking pole, and you can go without any tracking poles. I personally, I always have one tracking pole with me. Um, I just find it nice to stabilize myself and I still have a hand free to maybe have somebody on, on a rope or something like that, if I have to belay or short rope somebody. So I myself, generally I have one tracking pole with me, but figure out what works best for you. And the last thing, when you have steep inclines, the more altitude that you make with one step, the smaller make the step. You will note that it is much less strenuous and unpleasant to walk, to walk upwards when you start making smaller steps when the incline is bigger. Um, that's somehow something that I often see people trying to power through and um, just make smaller steps. It's, it's okay, that's normal, that's what we do, right? So, um, and the same of course counts for, for walking downhill, but there it is not um, a consideration because of the force. It, it might be because walking downhill can be very tiring for on your, on your muscles, but um, it's also a safety consideration so that you don't slip when you make a big step downwards. 
Fifth point that you should consider is hydration and nutrition. It is super important to stay hydrated. Um, there you have to strike a balance because the more water you bring, the more water you have to carry. Um, for me, even if I climbed big routes where I was climbing for 18 hours, uh, north faces in winter, um, I was more than fine with one liter of water. Um, it is really up to you. You will also get more efficient with, um, with drinking the water. What you shouldn't do is, what I often see, is that people really don't consider the first points and start too fast and walk upwards too quickly. And then they, they really get out of breath and um, then they start drinking water because it feels for them as if it would uh, lower the actual um, intensity of what they're doing and it is not. It's just a waste of water. So if you really walk a good pace, you should be able to take a small sip of water, put the bottle away and then continue walking. I personally prefer bottles. Um, I understand the, the benefits of Camelback. It's a completely different video, but I don't like that I don't see how much water I have left on my back. So for me, a bottle is the way to go. The same is true for nutrition. Um, I feel that most people take too much food with them for a day tour. Um, for me, it's usually enough if I bring a few chocolate bars, cliff bars, whatever you like. But make sure that you experiment a little bit there because if you eat something new for the first time at altitude while you have, uh, you have you're moving physically, um, that might upset your stomach and that's really not nice. So um, I, I have seen that. Thank God I haven't had that problem yet. But um, be really careful with that because, uh, I mean, that's a, yeah, it's a shit show, right? So um, yeah, make sure that you bring food, but bring food that you're used to. Um, experiment with it in a safe environment, at home, etc. See how your uh, body reacts to it. And then really only bring as much as you really need. And lastly, that might not sound like, like a tip, but it's really um, try to consider the leave no trace maxims. Um, if we destroy nature when we walk through it. And this is especially true for, for people who walk on well-traveled trails, but it is also true for people who are up in very um, sensitive uh, habitats. So um, yeah, leave no trail because if we mess up the nature and our surroundings, and they will just close down the trails and you will lose access. Um, of course, in certain countries, you are legally free to go wherever you want. There it is. You're right. Um, it still might um, give you more trouble because trailheads are not maintained. In other countries, uh, for example, I know in the US, for example, their access to climbing spots, especially on private land, um, is a big topic. So try to stay with the leave no trace movement and actually take your stuff with you. I mean, it's not too bad. And that not only includes the package of your cliff bars, but also the cigarette butts. I mean, don't smoke, period, right? But if you have to smoke out there, then take your cigarette butts with you. Um, it's also true for human waste. Um, I know it can be, um, I would say in an extreme situation like the one we discussed before, if your stomach is really upset, okay, then so be it. But um, try to plan in a way so that you don't have to leave human waste out there, right? Okay, those were my key points for, for a better hiking experience. Um, some of them are really meant to help you. Some of them help, are meant to help you to interact better with the environment. Um, if you found them helpful, please leave us a thumbs up. Consider following the channel. If you do so, hit the notification bell. Um, we're publishing videos every week. And yeah, I really appreciate that you took the time watching this video. If you have any question, put it in the comments below. And I'll see you next time.